This LOS is describe hedge funds, private equity, real estate, commodities, infrastructure, and other alternative investments, including, as applicable, strategies, subcategories, potential benefits and risks, fee structures, and due diligence. So we're going to start with hedge funds, and the typical contemporary hedge fund can be characterized as follows. It is an aggressively managed portfolio of investments across asset classes and regions that is leveraged, which means they can borrow money, takes long and short positions, and or uses derivatives. It has a goal of generating high returns, either in an absolute sense or over a specified benchmark and has few, if any, investment restrictions. It is set up as a private investment partnership opened to a limited number of investors willing and able to make a large initial investment. It often imposes restrictions on redemptions. Investors may be required to keep their money in the hedge fund for a minimum period, referred to as a lockup period, before they are allowed to make withdrawals or redeem shares. Investors may be required to give notice of their intent to redeem, and the notice period is typically 30 to 90 days in length. We're going to look at a few hedge fund strategies, and the first strategy is an event-driven strategy. An event-driven strategy seek to profit from short-term events. One example is merger arbitrage. You buy shares of the firm being acquired, and you short the shares of the acquirer. Because in general, on average, the research has shown that the firm that's being acquired, the prices will increase, and the acquiring firms, their price decreases. So that's a merger arbitrage. A second example of an event-driven strategy is distressed restructuring. You buy if, uh, if restructuring will increase the value. The third event-driven strategy is active as shareholder, gain board seats to influence the company decisions. Okay? And the fourth is special situations such as spin-offs, asset sales, security issuance, or repurchase. The next hedge fund strategy that we'll look at is relative value strategies. And relative value funds seek to profit from a pricing discrepancy, which is an unusual short-term relationship between related securities. The expectation is that the pricing discrepancy will be resolved in time. This, strat this strategy typically involves buying and selling related securities. So we're looking at five relative value strategies here. Fixed income convertible arbitrage, where you're looking at convertible bonds versus the underlying common stock. Fixed income asset-backed, we're looking at asset-backed securities and mortgage-backed securities. General fixed income. Volatility, trade options based on implied versus expected volatility. And finally, multi-strategy, which is across asset classes. Okay, before we bash on with more strategy with regards to hedge funds, I just want to point out that sometimes I do go outside the CFA curriculum if I want to increase my understanding of an area. So, for example, when we're talking about ETFs, I like to look at the iShares website because they're the biggest. When we get into some of the hedge fund readings, I like to go outside sometimes the CFA curriculum and see what's being done in the real world. So, one of the largest hedge fund companies in the world is Man AHL, and I'm just taking a screenshot here of their website. Uh, you can see it's uh, www.hl.com, then programs. So, for example, if I click here on the volatility, the long, short volatility, it's going to give me some information about, um, uh, you know, the systematic quantitative strategy, trading volatility markets directionally. Uh, they've been doing this since 2011. Slide down, you see a little bit here on the approach, the gamma strategy, the Vega strategy, the style allocation here. Uh, so there's some information, a little bit about the performance, not great since inception. And then again, there's some related research here. What is volatility? Uh, is risk volatility? And you can download a PDF. And finally, one last screenshot. This is just Russell Investments. Again, uh, relative value investment strategies. They've got some uh, learnings as well. Learn more about our, our, our alternative investment solutions. You can click on alternative investments. And, uh, you know, Russell Investments, again, quite a huge um, company. And you can see their alternative investment and strategies include real, uh, real assets, real estate, infrastructure, commodities, hedge funds, private capital. 
So again, uh, just a quick little note there that um, sometimes when you're studying, go outside the curriculum, look at some of the Google search, do some, uh, you know, bring up some of the bigger companies and see, uh, learn from their websites. It helps complement the curriculum quite a bit, okay? So back to the slides now, continue with hedge funds and some of the strategies. Now we're looking at a macro strategy. Macro hedge funds emphasize a top-down approach to identify economic trends evolving across the world. Trades are made based on expected movements and economic variables. Generally, these funds trade opportunistically in the fixed income, equity, currency, and commodity markets. Macro hedge funds use long and or short positions to potentially profit from a view on overall market direction as influenced by major economic trends and or events. So an example of some equity hedge fund strategies, um, in the next section, equity hedge fund strategies, market neutral, equal values in long and short positions, fundamental growth, identify high growth companies, fundamental value, identify undervalued companies, quantitative directional, may have net long or short exposure, short bias, a net short exposure, and uh, finally, sector specific expertise in sectors. So after the strategies, now we're gonna look at hedge fund fees and other considerations. So a common fee structure in the hedge fund market is two and 20, which reflects a 2% management fee and a 20% incentive fee. Sometimes the fee structure specifies that the incentive fee is only earned after the fund achieves a specified return known as a hurdle rate. So the incentive fee can be based on returns in excess of the hurdle rate, which is a hard hurdle rate, or on the entire return, which is a soft hurdle rate. The fee structure may specify that before an incentive fee is paid, following a year in which the fund's value has declined, the fund's value must return to a previous high watermark. Note that the high watermark is typically the highest value reported by the fund. The amount reported is net of fees. High watermarks reflect the highest cumulative return used to calculate an incentive fee. In other words, the hedge fund must recover its past losses and return to its high watermark before any additional incentive fee is earned. Now don't worry, the next LOS is describe, calculate, and interpret management and incentive fees and net of fees returns to hedge funds. So we're gonna look at fees in much more detail in the following learning outcome statement. Now we're turning our attention uh, to due diligence for investing in hedge funds. There are many issues to consider when investing in hedge funds. So there's 10 key factors here to consider to include. One is the investment strategy. Two, investment process. Three, competitive advantage. Four, track record size and longevity. Five, management style. Six, key person risk. Seven, reputation. Eight, investor relations nine, plans for growth, and finally 10, systems risk management. Now we'll do a quick practice question to help consolidate our understanding. A hedge fund invests primarily in distressed debt. Quoted market prices are available for the underlying holdings, but they trade infrequently. Which of the following will the hedge fund most likely use in calculating net asset value for trading purposes? A, average quotes. B, average quotes adjusted for liquidity or C, bid prices for short positions and ask prices for long positions? That's a good question because if you got it wrong, this is an example, go back to the text and find where it is in the text and uh, you'll see that it is in the text. So B is correct. Many practitioners believe that liquidity discounts are necessary to reflect fair value. This has resulted in some funds having two net asset values for trading and for reporting. These, the fund may use an average quotes for reporting purposes, but apply liquidity discounts for trading purposes. So I'm using that last practice question as an example to set, show you that if you got it wrong, uh, what I did here is I just did a uh, search in the ebook for average quote, okay? Then it's gonna highlight and I can zoom in and okay, I found it here with hedge fund valuation issues. And wait a minute, I even found a practice question that's very similar to the one that we did that has a different uh, answer. So this is why I said it's really important to always go back to the text uh, if you get something wrong and, and find out where it is in the text. And every time you do that, you're gonna learn something, okay? 
So you can see here, value, so hedge fund valuation issues, valuations are important for calculating performance and meeting redemptions. The frequencies with which and how hedge funds are valued varies among funds. Hedge funds are generally valued on a daily, weekly, monthly, and or quarterly basis, okay? So just scroll over to, to the right a little bit. The valuation may use market prices or estimated values uh, of underlying positions. When market prices or quotes are used, um, for valuation, funds may differ in which price or quote they use. For example, bid price, ask price, average quote, median quote. Common practice is to use the average quote, bid plus ask divided by two. Okay, a more conservative and theoretically accurate approach is to use the bid price for longs and the ask price for shorts. Uh, these are the prices at which the positions could be closed. Okay, so you can see there's some good stuff there with regards to the valuation. Now, if we look at this blue box example for um, example five in terms of the hedge fund valuation, you can see this question is very similar, but the answer is different. So a hedge fund with a market neutral strategy restricts its investment universe uh, to domestic publicly traded equity securities that are actively traded. In calculating net asset value, the fund is most likely to use which of the following underlying positions. So A is average quotes. B is average quotes adjusted for liquidity, which was the correct answer for our last practice question that we just did. And C is the bid price for shorts and ask price for longs. In this case, A is correct. The fund is most likely to use average quotes. The securities are actively traded, so no liquidity adjustment is required. If the fund uses bid ask prices, the fund would use uh, ask prices for shorts and bid prices for longs. And uh, these are the prices at which the positions could be closed, okay? So again, uh, very important to go back to the text when you get a question wrong, or if you don't understand a question, or hey, where did that come from? Do a bit of a search, go back, find it, and guaranteed you're gonna learn something that's gonna help you for the exam. Now we're moving on to private equity. Firms that invest in private companies or take public companies private, okay? Private equity strategies include leveraged buyouts, LBOs, venture capital, developmental capital, minority equity, private investment in public equity, and distressed investing. So looking at private equity strategies, the first one that we're gonna look at is leveraged buyouts. And this is the most common private equity strategy. It's funded by debt, that's why leveraged buyouts, we're using debt, it's leveraged and it's bank debt or, and or uh, high yield bonds, okay? So there's some terminology that you need here. Mezzanine financing, which is subordinated debt, includes warrants or conversion to equity. M management buyout is the current managers involved in the purchase remain with the company. And management buy-in is you're gonna replace the managers of the acquired company. Moving on to venture capital. Uh, there's three stages here, the formative stage, the later stage, and the mezzanine stage, okay? So you've got to memorize these stages, and you can see within the formative stage, there's uh, three sub-stages. Uh, a is the angel investing. That's when there's business plans have been made and there's market potential. Business hasn't really started. That's where you get your angels. The next stage is the seed stage, where there's product development is taking uh, place and market research is being done, so the business is being seeded, and then there's the early stage where you're beginning some production and sales. In the later stage, uh, so there might be some venture capital, uh, more venture capital being provided for a major expansion. And then finally, we get to the mezzanine stage where you're preparing the company for an IPO, initial public offering, which is uh, often the exit strategy for the venture capital company. Do a quick practice question to check our understanding. Angel investing capital is typically provided in which stage of financing? A, later stage, B, formative stage, or C, mezzanine stage? Now that should be a really easy question. B is correct. Formative stage financing occurs when the company is still in the process of being formed and encompasses several financing steps. Angel investing capital is typically raised in this early stage of financing. So again, on the right-hand side, I just copied uh, from the previous slide, the formative stage, angel investing, seed stage, early stage. Those three components fall within the formative stage. Then you've got the later stage, which is the major expansion 
and the uh, me mezzanine stage is where you're preparing for the IPO. So again, lots of little memorization for the CFA exam, but uh, you, I think you would agree with me that this type of question is really easy and it doesn't take 90 seconds uh, if you're up to speed um, with the content in the curriculum. So now we're looking at private equity and private equity exit strategies. Trade sell, you're gonna sell the portfolio to a competitor. One is a, a secondary sell, sell the portfolio to other public equity investors. IPO, which we've seen in the previous mezzanine stage, preparing the company for IPO, and you're gonna sell the portfolio company shares to the public. That's a very popular uh, private equity exit strategy. Uh, the next one is recapitalization, issue portfolio company debt to fund dividend payment to the private equity owner. And finally, uh, could be a write-off liquidation, take a loss, if the uh, company has not worked out. Just do a quick practice question to help consolidate our understanding. Hedge funds are similar to private equity funds in that both A, are typically structured as partnerships, B, assess management fees based on assets under management, or C, do not earn an incentive fee until the initial investment is repaid. Hopefully you found that to be an easy question, it should be. A is correct, private equity funds and hedge funds are typically structured as partnerships where investors are limited partners and the fund is the general partner. The management fee for private equity funds is based on committed capital, whereas for hedge funds, the management fees are based on assets under management. So that's a key important point, okay? For most private equity funds, the general partner does not earn an incentive fee until the limited partners have received their initial investment back. Moving on to real estate now, real estate investing is often thought of as direct or indirect ownership. Indirect would be equity investing through REITs, real estate investment trusts, for example. Uh, so direct or indirect ownership in real estate property such as land or buildings. However, real estate investing also includes lending, debt investing against real estate property. For example, providing a mortgage loan or purchasing mortgage-backed securities. The property generally serves as collateral for the lending. So the different types of real estate properties are residential property, commercial property, mortgages, mortgage-backed securities, real estate investment trusts, REITs as I said, and finally farmland and timberland. Just putting in a quick practice question here. An investor is seeking an investment that can take long and short positions, may use multi-strategies, and historically exhibits low correlation with a traditional investment portfolio. The investor's goals will be best satisfied with an investment in A, real estate, B, a hedge fund, or C, a private equity fund. I think that question is really easy. When you see long and short positions, multi-strategies, uh, then you know that we're looking at hedge funds. So B is correct. Hedge funds may use a variety of strategies, event-driven, relative value, macro and equity hedge, and generally have a low correlation with traditional investments, which we've seen before, and may take the long and short positions. Okay, I just wanted to slide that in there because we've looked at hedge funds, then we looked at the private equity, we looked briefly at the real estate. So you can see these types of questions for alternative investments are uh, relatively easy, I believe. The only issue is the next LOS where you need to do a few calculations with regards to the management and incentive fees. Other than that, the uh, section on alternative investments uh, really is quite introductory and quite easy. Now we're moving on to commodities. Commodities exposure is most commonly gained through derivatives rather than outright ownership. The return comes from price changes, there's no income, and it's a hedge to inflation risk. So continuing with commodities, we're going to look at some information here with regards to commodity derivatives and indices. So different ways of investing in commodities. One way is through commodity ETFs. This is available to investors who are restricted to equity shares. Uh, another way of getting exposure to commodities is through the shares of commodity producers. But in this case, there's less than perfect correlation with commodity prices. So for example, to gold as a commodity, you could invest in gold ETFs, or you can invest in the shares of Barrick which is a company that is a gold mining company, okay? Uh, but the shares of the commodity producers uh, exhibit less than perfect correlation with the commodity prices. 
You can also invest in managed futures funds where there's active management of commodity investments, uh, individual management accounts, and finally, there are mutual funds where, that are commodity sector funds, for example, focusing on the energy industry. Continuing with commodities, it is important to understand futures contracts and the sources of return for each commodity futures contract because commodity investments often involve the use of futures contracts. So these contracts trade on exchanges. Given the characteristics of a commodity, the price of a futures contract, the futures price, may be approximated by the following formula. Futures prices equals the spot price times 1 plus R, the interest rate, plus storage costs minus convenience yield. There are three sources of return for each commodity futures contract. The roll yield, the collateral yield, and the change in spot prices for the underlying commodity. So first we'll look at the roll yield. The term roll yield refers to the difference between the spot price of a commodity and the price specified by its future contract, or the difference between two futures contracts with different expiration dates. The formula shows that with a convenience yield high enough to position the futures price below the spot price, the price of the futures contract generally rolls up to the spot price as the expiry date of the futures contract approaches. This price convergence earns the bearer of the futures contract a positive roll yield. This explanation is called the theory of storage. An alter alternative theory called the hedging pressure hypothesis suggests the difference between the spot price and futures price is determined by user preferences and risk premiums. Moving on to the collateral yield, the collateral yield component of the commodity index returns is the interest earned on the collateral plus invested cash up to the value of the underlying asset posted as good faith deposit in the futures contracts. In measuring this component of return, index managers typically assume that futures contracts are fully collateralized and that the collateral is invested in risk-free assets. Thus, the returns on a passive investment in commodity futures are expected to equal the return on the collateral plus a risk premium, i.e. hedging pressure hypothesis, or the convenience yield net of storage costs, i.e. the theory of storage. Finally, looking at spot prices, the primary determinant of spot or current prices is the relationship between current supply and demand. Just going to finish up this section on commodities with a look at uh, contango and backwardation and what that means. So recall the futures price is the spot price times 1 plus R, which is the interest rate, plus storage costs minus the convenience yield. So future prices may be higher or lower than the spot price depending on the convenience yield. When future prices are higher than the spot price, the commodity forward future curve is upward sloping and, and the prices are referred to being in contango. Contango occurs when there is little or no convenience yield. Okay? So when future prices are lower than the spot price, the commodity forward curve is downward sloping and the prices are referred to as being in backwardation. Backwardation occurs when the convenience yield is high. So let's do a practice question to help check our understanding. If a commodity's forward curve is in contango, the component of a commodity's future return most likely to reflect this is A, spot prices, B, the roll yield, or C, the collateral yield. The correct answer is B. If a commodity's forward curve is in contango, the component of a commodity's future return most likely to reflect this is the roll yield. Roll yield refers to the difference between the spot prices of a commodity and the price specified by its future contract, or the difference between two futures contracts with different expiration dates. When future prices are higher than the spot price, the commodity forward curve is upward sloping and their prices are referred to as being in contango. Contango occurs when there is little or no convenience yield. Moving on now to infrastructure, the assets underlying infrastructure investments are real, capital-intensive, long-lived assets which are intended for public use and provide essential services. Most infrastructure assets are financed, owned, and operated by governments, but increasingly infrastructure assets are being financed privately. The intent may be to lease the assets back to the government, to sell newly constructed assets to the government, or to hold and operate the assets. From an investment perspective, if the assets are being held and operated, there is relatively inelastic demand for the assets and services. 
The high costs of the assets create high barriers to entry, which give the provider of the services a strong competitive position. Investors expect these assets to generate stable cash flows, which adjust for economic growth and inflation. Investors may also expect capital appreciation, depending on the type of investment. The lowest risk infrastructure investments have more stable cash flows and higher dividend payouts, but also typically have less growth opportunities and lower expected returns. And we're finishing this learning outcome statement with other alternative investments. It's been a pretty long LOS. There are numerous other investments that do not fit within the definition of traditional investments and may be considered alternative investments. Many of these other investments are categorized as collectibles. Collectibles are tangible assets such as antiques and fine art, fine wines, rare stamps and coins, jewelry and watches, and sports memorabilia. Collectibles do not provide current income, but they can potentially provide long-term capital appreciation, diversify a portfolio, and be a source of enjoyment while held. Collectibles can fluctuate dramatically in value and be highly liquid with potential difficulty in re realizing gains. And we're just going to finish this LOS with another point that I want to bring up. Uh, now this is not in the CFA curriculum, the text of the reading for the CFA Level 1, but if uh, as a candidate you are have access to the CFA Institute and all the journal publications, etc. there, and sometimes there's some excellent articles that you want to read that again can help complement your understanding. So one of them, uh, the art, uh, an article that I really like, is uh, from the 2014 March-April Financial Analyst Journal. It's called Investing in Emotional Assets. And so the collectibles, they give that a term of investments of passion, okay? And so the authors, Elroy Dimson and Christopher, uh, wrote a very interesting paper and they reviewed the long-term investment performance of collectibles and found that the so-called emotional assets have outperformed government bonds, treasury bills, and gold over the long run. However, the costs of trading in these markets are high and an investor faces many dangers and pitfalls. Emotional assets are particularly attractive to some high net worth investors. Okay, So at the end of the day, you can see that uh, if we look at the chart, their research from 1900 to 2012, we can still see that equities pretty much have the highest return long term on average in terms of geometric returns and, um, uh, and a fairly high standard deviation as well. So they did a nice job of looking at the nominal returns and the real returns. Again, we can see here equities have had the best returns, but they're looking at some art, stamps, violins, uh, gold, etc. Okay. So again, I just wanted to uh, point out that sometimes when you're studying the CFA and you've got the time, go outside the curriculum. In this uh, LOS, we looked at a couple of websites with regards to hedge funds to get more information. And we're finishing up here, as I said, with a nice article uh, with regards to investing in emotional assets, investments of passion, and the collectibles. And this article was on the CFA Institute website. And again, uh, if you've got time, look at some of the articles um, and publications that uh, you have got access to. So you can see here I'm just taking a screenshot of the CFA Institute website and uh, here's the article Investing in Emotional Assets. So it's the uh, home, insights and learning, publications and multimedia, publications, uh, lots here with regards to the uh, browsing the library. So again, if there's a, a topic that uh, interests you, like hedge funds or, or uh, you know anything that you're studying throughout the curriculums, level one, level two, level three, sometimes uh, do a search and see if there's a publication or an article that uh, catches your attention, and sometimes that really helps uh, you know complement the curriculum, consolidate your learnings. And with that, that's the last for this LOS. Thank you.